Today's video is going to be great, because I'm going to be talking about one of my favourite subjects, two-player board games, and every single game in this video is fantastic. This wasn't going to be today's video, because originally I was planning to review Redacted. but Essen Spiel is coming up, which is a very big convention in Germany, and for the first time in three years, we are actually going, and we ran out of time a little bit, because that video needs a little bit more work, so instead I was like, quick, I need to find something to talk about unscripted, so uh, what better subject than two-player board games, because I love them, you love them, because hey, you clicked on this video, so uh, we're gonna go over these, but first, I want to let you know what makes two-player games great. There are a lot of good two-player games, and I think if you're familiar with board games somewhat by now, you're already thinking, oh, where's Hive, or where's Patchwork, or where's another game that you like that is meant for two players, and a lot of other people agree is very good. My argument is that they are good games, but they are not specifically great two-player games. Because the difference is that a great two-player game needs to do a lot more than just be a very good game. Two-player is a very intimate environment. It's just you and one other person. In all board game situations that are non-solo board game situations, games are a social environment. You play and you converse. And maybe some games are a little bit more solitary, look at your board and do your own thing. But generally, you want a little bit of conversation. With three or four people, if things go a little bit silent, that's okay, because, you know, you still feel like you're in a crowded environment. With two players, it's a lot more intimate. Which isn't so much of a problem if you're playing with someone who you are very comfortable with, such as, say, your partner, but can be a touch more awkward if you're playing with someone who is an acquaintance or a friend that you don't know that well yet. So a great two-player game needs to be an icebreaker. It needs to start conversations. It needs to be jovial. Or it needs to be so engrossing that that awkwardness just melts away. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of these and how they achieve that. One of the best ways to get people talking is to pepper the game with surprises. But also surprises are incredibly frustrating. If your opponent plays a card that says, ha ha, I append your entire master plan. Well, one person is having fun, whereas the other person is just experiencing low-key resentment. The way Airland and Cedar surprises is great. All you're trying to do in this game is take control of two theaters by playing cards to these theaters, and then at the end of the round having bigger number than your opponent. If you win two of these, you win the round, you get six points. If you have 12 points, you win. That's simple. But what is ingenious is the abilities on these cards, because they do all kinds of things. For example, I could play a card face down instead of face up, then it's only worth two points. And then, if I play this card on a latter turn that says, hey, flip one of your opponent's cards, so this four now becomes a two, flip one of your cards, this two becomes a six. Immediately obvious why it's get great, and might be a little bit frustrating on the outside, but when you realize there's only 18 cards to learn in the entire game, all the strategies are very obvious. You know what's possible. You know what you can achieve, you know what your opponent can achieve, and there's also this nice push and pull between when you end the round, because you can end the round by playing out all your cards and seeing who has more numbers, or you can concede early and thus give your opponent less points. It's just a great game at getting people to talk to each other, because it's always obvious what your opponent is doing when they've done it, but it's not obvious until they've done it. So when they do something, you go, Ah, I see what you've done! I see what you've done! And that's just a great feeling, which makes Airland and Sea a great two-player board game. One note, do not confuse it with Heroes of Land, Air and Sea, which is an entirely different game, and in my humble opinion, is in fact rubbish. So just, just steer clear of the heroes and get yourself Airland and Sea. 18 cards, great game. Friends don't let other friends play Targi, because you don't play Targi to make friends, you play Targi to make enemies. I've never played a game that's this cutthroat. I don't know what's happening here. It's just like, 
Every time you make a move, the other person on the other side of the table hates you, immediately hates you. What you do in Targi is pretty simple. You have three pieces. Over the course of a round, you're gonna place them on the cards on the outskirts of a board. If I place it here, I will get some salt. Also gonna make my opponent salty. Now the reason for that is that what your opponent now can't do is place their piece on the card opposite your piece. So that is no longer a legal move. So they would place it here, then I would place mine maybe here. Suddenly there's not that many spaces left, then the opponent places theirs here, and then I can't place mine here, or here, or here. I could place it here, and that is now the only valid card for my opponent. Now what happens next is pretty crucial, because on top of getting the things that we have on, on the cards where we place the pieces, we also find the intersection between our pieces and get to nab the very, very important cards in the middle, which is how you're gonna get points. This is a devilishly mean game because every time you place a piece, you are basically taking away a quarter of the board from your opponent. The options constrict every moment of this game. So anytime anyone places a piece, you go, you basilisk, and then you basilisk, and then you basilisk, and then you basilisk, and that's basically how this game plays. Just you basilisk, you basilisk, you basilisk, you basilisk. I think out of all the games we're covering today, just because of how unreservedly mean it is, I I like it. I like it a lot, and I think it has that instant appeal because. It is surprisingly social for a two-player game. It evokes so many emotions, and not all of them are positive, but they're at least fun. It's not often I can sell the idea of a board game with a simple shake of a fist, but that's precisely what Lacuna does, because the way you set Lacuna up is... Lacuna is what we in the uh, biz call an abstract game, and abstract games are just that. They've got an abstract setting, so Lacuna means the space between things, and that's all you do in this game. You take your piece, you put it between two things, and then you take those things for yourself. You can only place your piece between two flowers of the same color, and what you want to do in this game is win four colors. You win a color when you have four flowers of that color. There are seven flowers in each color and seven colors total, opening up this game to a nice bit of math because, you know, it's like, if I win four colors, that means you can only win three colors. If I have four flowers in a color, that means you can only have three flowers in the color. There's no tiebreakers, there's no like weirdness. It's just straightforward and fun. The other piece of beautiful math in this game is that there are 49 flowers. One player gets one flower at the beginning, but then as you place these pieces, which you only have six of, so 12 in total, exactly 24 flowers will be cleared off. As you can see, all the pieces have been placed, but only half of the flowers have been distributed, and so far, no one is winning. How do you decide which player wins the game? Well, here's the thing, these pieces do their job one more time, except this time, they hoover up all the flowers that are closest to them. So for example, this piece would very easily grab this, 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 all of this stuff that is adjacent to it, and closer to it rather than to its opponent's pieces. So every time you place a piece, you're not just thinking about the two flowers that you're going to grab, you're thinking about the potential game state. Ooh, can I block my opponent here? Can I kind of close this area off? Are they wanna gonna place their piece next to the, some of these other flowers because they're gaining for this color or that color? It's just thinking and crunchy and all you're doing is just kind of putting a piece down and perhaps out of all the games that I am talking about today, this is admittedly the least talky one, but it is so simple and so self-evident that it's just engrossing. And also, it's beautiful. I mean, look at these. These are nice wooden pieces. This is a cloth board. These are nice metal pieces. And then you shake the thing out. It takes about 10 minutes to play, which I think is a benefit because it's just one of these two player games that you can wind the evening down with. You know, you've already played something good. Why don't we just play another round of Lacuna? And then after that other round of Lacuna, 
maybe we'll feel like another round of lacuna, and then maybe another round of lacuna, and maybe, you know, just one more round of lacuna, why not? It sounds good, sounds good. It's delightful. It just feels so moorish, you engage with it, and feels slight, but it's just a little bit crunchy and nice, and then it tickles something in your brain and you go, yeah, let's go again. This is just nice, this is really nice. I think you can tell this is nice, but I'm also telling you this isn't just nice. There's a bit more meat to it than it first appears. Magic the Gathering is not a great game. Take it from someone who's spent five years of his life invested into it. It can be a good competitive game, but you have to invest hundreds of pounds into it. And by that point, you are invested, literally financially invested into a commodity. And that doesn't lead you into good places. So what about alternatives? Well, there are a dime a dozen. There's literally Magic the Gathering clones coming out 10 times a year. And a lot of them aren't very good. I don't know if World Breakers is the best one out of them. I don't know how to define that but I know that that's the one I've enjoyed the most. The idea isn't that different from Magic the Gathering. You have followers, which are kind of like creatures, and then you have these location cards, which are all the other magic card types combined. But the trick is that you don't just have your turn. All you can do on your turn is one action, and that could be drawing a card, or it could be playing a card, or it could be getting some resources, or it could be doing other things on your card specific to you. But what's really good about this is that it flips the standard script of magic on its head. Instead of dealing your opponent 20 damage or whatever, what you need to do is accrue 10 power to win. You might recognize the idea of taking actions from another card game called Netrunner. And World Breakers is strangely like an amalgam of the two because your attacking creatures often don't benefit their entire attack towards success because all they need to do is be unblocked and that will reward you one power for each follower attacking. Or instead they could trample over one of your opponent's locations as well, removing these tokens from them which let your opponent activate the location and do the ability on it, which often also gives your opponent power, so that way you're denying power to them. And there's this strange to and fro where blocking means something else than it does in magic and attacking means something else that it does in magic. And sometimes it can feel a little bit like running in Netrunner, but everything's so incredibly condensed. But here is the best thing about World Breakers. This is the entire game of World Breakers. You get it, it has four factions, you play it, that's it. Now, the appeal of collectible or trading card games is that you get more and more cards to build your decks. And there are expansions, there's already one announced and coming out in the future. But again, it's a self-contained expansion. You get everything in that box. You get all the cards that you need to do deck building or whatever, and that's it. And that feels financially just much more sound as an investment because you're not investing your emotions you're just buying a thing to enjoy. And also, World Breakers is produced by an indie publisher. And, you know, rather than buying booster packs from a corporation that literally prints millions of them and does add to environmental waste, it feels much better to just invest into someone who is clearly passionate about making this and making these just a little bit more sustainable. I think that's nice. If you look up the word wholesome in the dictionary, you will find a picture of Bob Mortimer and Paul Whitehouse in their seminal BBC show Gone Fishing, but right next to that is a copy of Sleeping Gods. I love this game. I've gone on about it for an hour in a separate video, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's just so good at what it does. The idea is that you're managing the crew of a ship called the Manticore, which has been transported to a faraway magical land and you're trying to find your way back home. Meanwhile, your ship is getting battered, so you need to make sure you have enough resources, food, maintaining it. So it's like a management game. But on top of that, you're traveling to various different locations and then reading passages from a storybook. If you're not a fan of little story vignettes peppered in your big narrative adventure game, then 
Maybe this game isn't necessarily for you, but I didn't think I was a fan of that and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because it had such a cohesive vision of the world that you're inhabiting. You're learning about its culture, its traditions, its geography, just you're transported, right? And, and there's something very powerful in that. And of course, it gets you talking because you have to read story to each other. And additionally, you were invested into it because you were immersed in the world that it is building. What makes this a great two-player game is that you are talking to each other all the time because, hey, you have to read story passages, but also you are immersed in its world. You can play this game by yourself, but you really want to feel like you're sharing this adventure with someone else. You also get to split the crew in half. One player takes control of four characters, another player takes control of four characters, and the role of the captain alternates between them. And with four characters each, you really do feel immersed because there's just a lot of management happening and there's the ship management and there's all these stories that you read. I think it's really good. I really enjoy it. I can't recommend it enough. If you want to find out more, we did an hour long video about it and you can watch that. And also a podcast episode about it. So check out that on Talk Cardboard. When you look at a miniature like this, is your first immediate thought, this must be a great two-player game, because mine wasn't. Imagine my surprise when I tried Ankh. Like many of its ilk, this is a game where you have big minis and smaller minis and they go about the map and control various territories. You have fights, things change all the time, there's exciting powers and abilities and tracks and all kinds of things, and it takes about, you know, two hours to play. But what makes it a really great two-player game is its combat system. Whenever two different factions fight in this game, you'll count up their power by how many troops they have in the region, all this standard stuff. But then each of you will also play a combat card face down and flip it face up. These have various effects, but the most interesting thing about these cards is that some of these cards are not geared towards you winning the fight you might intentionally play the card with the aim of losing, because losing might net you more points than winning. So in a two-player environment where it's head-to-head, -head, it's always mind games. What's better yet is that one of these cards is literally the nuclear option, as in you blow everything up. And just the mind game of, are you gonna play the nuclear option? Am I gonna play the nuclear option? Who's gonna play the nuclear option? What's gonna happen? Is everything going to blow up? I don't know. That makes Ankh amazing. I cannot recommend Ankh enough, but if you want me to recommend Ankh some more, then again, we did a whole video about it. You can watch that, find out everything that's going on here. To explain trick-taking games, or more specifically, climbing and shedding games, would take the entire length of this segment, so naturally I'm just not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you that this is the best two-player climbing shedding game that I've played. Card games like this require a lot of people around the table constantly playing cards and changing the game state in the middle of the table. With two people, it's just one person plays, and then another person plays, and then one person plays, and then another person plays, so the game state doesn't evolve that much. 535 knows this and instead leverages this tempo to its advantage. You always have to respond to what your opponent does because as soon as you can't, then you're trapped. So the entire time you're playing this frankly giant hand of cards, you're thinking, is this play gonna get me what I want right now and also in the long run? There's a lot of strategic planning and figuring out which numbers you should save, which numbers you should get rid of. There's a lot going on. And actually, one of the most surprising things about 535 is how gentle it felt the first time I played it. And there was something that clicked in my brain right at the very end of that game. I noticed the strategy that I just didn't see throughout the entire playtime, and I immediately wanted to play again and try my hand at that strategy. And when I did that, more strategies developed, and then more strategies, and we were talking about them constantly. We were noticing these things in the game that we didn't observe before. And it felt like every time we played 535, something evolved and bloomed and the game deepened and it was a joy to discover this with another person. I've played 535 with more than two players. It was just nowhere near as good. I recommend this at two, although I will note 
This is an incredibly indie game and it might be a little bit hard to find it. So far for all of these games, we've created a nice table presentation just whilst I talk about them. But with Spirit Island, I just can't do that. And here's why. I have mistakenly and foolishly tried to pack too many expansions into one box and now I've ended up with this and frankly I don't know what anything is anymore but what I do know is that Spirit Island is just such a great game and I think if you've heard about board games, you've probably heard about this game. You play as spirits on an island that is being invaded by uh, white pieces representing colonialists. So, you know, the theme speaks for itself. This is a cooperative game and in it you are playing various cards to stave off this expansion, which is relentless and feels almost insurmountable. When you're playing with four players, for example, this map is twice the size. There's so many more territories to manage, so many more people sitting down with their heads in their hands and thinking about uh, which card do I play? Do I play this one? Do I play that one? What I need to think about this and that and that. It just takes so much time. It's great at two because it takes the right amount of time. But what makes it a great two-player game is that it's a game where you are sitting down and thinking and looking at your board and trying to figure out the puzzle. But then you are required to start talking with the other person because the plan that you just came up with individually needs to mesh with the plan that they've come up with. I should probably warn you that if you want to get Spirit Island, you should also get the Spirit Island Branch and Claw expansion because this is finally where the game comes alive. There are more expansions, but I wouldn't buy them unless you already played the game and you know that you really like it and you feel invested into these systems. But otherwise, this is the start to a really, really, really good, long, crunchy time. If you like your games big, expansive, and collaborative, I can't think of a better one. These are, of course, just the two-player board games I think are great. You might disagree. You might have some heated opinions. You think I missed out something very important, or maybe you have your own experience of playing these games. Uh, do leave a comment and please hit the subscribe button because uh, we are a small independent board game reviewing channel and we would like your support. You can also support us financially. That's what keeps us afloat by going to patreon.com slash no pun included and giving us a little bit of money every, every month. In return, you will get bonus episodes of our podcast Talk Cardboard, which goes out every other Monday. And also every other other Monday, we have one of these no pun included videos. Uh, usually they're scripted. This one was just off the cuff. So if you want more of that, I'll see you on Monday.